More often than not, an embedded project is more than just a blinky sketch, containing many unique approaches, ideas and structures. With a compiled language such as C, C++, you can easily make mistakes in a two-fold way, compile time and runtime errors. The former are usually easy to spot. Shortly after building, your compiler terminal is read with undefined reference to this and implicit cast to that. Much more sneaky are runtime errors. These occur after your program starts or a certain action, such as a button press, is performed. And since you work on an embedded system, those errors won't be caught and your system may reboot, losing important data or worse. Luckily, we can catch these errors before they cause damage with unit testing. I found myself jotting down an idea for a program in the train or some spare 15 minutes after lunch without the embedded system attached and later mindlessly integrating that part of the program into a project. Or even worse, coding for hours without uploading to the MCU once. Be smarter than my past self and make use of unit testing. Unit testing follows the philosophy that each part of the code that computes something should be probed for its correct computation in an isolated context. While a mathematician will debate you on whether you have to prove that 1 plus 1 is 2, a unit test does not have to probe all computations but most of them. How does this look in practice? Consider a piece of code that handles a transaction with an imaginary temperature sensor, communicating via the UART protocol. A lot of things can go wrong here. Let's start with the first one. UART transmit. This might be a system function or a wrapper you wrote for your MCU's UART peripheral. It takes a character pointer with a command and a size in bytes. Let's assume that this function returns something else than void, a success message for example, and you are simply too lazy to check it. I know that I've been too lazy in the past. This is the first issue. This function might return an error code in case that the peripheral is not initialized, blocked or not reachable for whatever reason. While you should always check return values in production code as well, we can also include that in a unit test. This simple test checks if transmitting a test string works, nothing else. We've essentially removed the first function call of get temp and tested it in an isolated context. We can also add more context tests, such as sending an empty or ridiculously long string to check how robust the system function UART transmit is. UART receive. In this function, we read data that has been sent back from the sensor. How such a retrieval works depends on the platform, but for simplicity, let us assume that this function returns the string in the UART receive register and overwrites it after retrieval, meaning it consumed the value. If nothing is in that buffer, the function returns without modifying the return buffer. Again, Again, we should assert that the return value itself represents that our system ended this function call normally. Again, we check for the successful transaction and also assert that the response has the expected length. In this example, the sensor always sends back 8 character bytes, including the terminating 0, which is why we check for a valid string length of response len minus 1. Now we can get into some more interesting tests. In Python unit testing, you would define pre-computed constants or fixtures to assert an algorithm's correct return value. Here, we are dealing with a live system that returns a value proportional to the state of thermodynamics around the sensor at this exact moment in time, or simpler how hot it is. If the sensor is next to you in your cozy death cave, you might expect something between 19 and 24 degrees Celsius, but certainly not 0 or 50, I hope so. But later in deployment, you might actually measure such temperatures. You might even hit the full range of the sensor. So let's also check for range to determine the correctness of a result. We do not test A to I, since it is a standard function that is guaranteed to work. In this example, the sensor is in your room and has to fulfill two conditions. First, results have to be in the range that the datasheet specified. If it isn't, something went wrong during transmission or data passing. Second, at the time of unit testing, with your sensor next to you in a room, you should expect room temperature. Anything else might be a wrong offset or conversion. Did you notice how I used macros like test assert equal for the explicit test call instead of concrete functions? I did not come up with this myself. This is the syntax of Unity, a testing framework for C applications with a lot of flexibility and a small footprint. For Arduino framework projects, it comes shipped with Platform.io and is plug and play ready. If you need some help to get started with Platform.io in general, see my beginner's guide. Create a file called testtempsensor.cpp under the folder test or optionally categorized under test slash test temp sensor your platform where you place your test code. In my case, under test slash test temp sensor ESP32 and the same for the STM32 because I want to test both platforms. Unity expects starter function definitions, which means a standard int main or the classic void setup and void loop of the Arduino framework. But let's make it concrete in a full copy pastable code snippet. In this test, we define optional setup and tear down functions to execute code before and after each test. 
This is practical for establishing defined before and after states for variables that are outside the scope or global. They don't need to be used or even defined. Next, we add all test functions from before. These will be tested by passing their function pointers to Unity's run test macro. This, however, needs to be pre and post fixed with Unity begin and Unity end. It is also a good practice to let the controller settle with a short delay before testing, as an immediate test may yield some undefined states from the external hardware, such as a temperature sensor, or or lead to the test messages being mangled with a boot up message from the controller, such as the ESP32. You can trigger a test by selecting the correct platform IO environment and pressing the little flask icon at the bottom. Alternatively, you can use the platform IO CLI with PIO test minus E my environment. Some platforms may take their time when test code is flashed for the first time. If you can't see any results, be sure that your controller does not crash directly at boot and that it can properly communicate with your client PC. For example, if you use a board such as the ESP32 S3 dev kit 1C, you have access to both a UART to USB connection and a general USB connection. If you flash that controller directly on the USB line, it will still expect to print test results to the UART to USB connection, which you might have connected to a broken cable or not at all. A successful test should look like this. We now have all the tools to test all the code. But a full test coverage, aka all functions are at least tested once in a unit test, will quickly increase the size of this file to four digit lines, at least in a bigger project. For this reason, it makes sense to split the tests into logical groups that are easier to manage in terms of maintenance and actual error catching. Suppose you have a system with multiple peripherals and some signal processing. These peripherals may be connected to entirely different sensors or other integrated circuits that use different buses and timings. In order to bunch all of these up categorically, you can introduce a custom test structure with folders and subfolders. In this example, we have an external SPI flash, an I2C C ADC and algorithms in implementing an FFT and other filtering. Let's split the tests like this. Testcommon.cpp will then be the file that calls all tests that are listed in the subfolders if you include them there. Alternatively, you can omit testcommon.cpp or h and have definitions for the program entry, meaning setup or main, in each one of the subfolders, which makes you able to pick them out for specific environments as such. When you now select the environment env io testing and run a test, it will only run the tests in the filtered folder test flash IO. If you do not specify a test filter, the tests under the normal test folder will be run. Now let's apply what we learned to this STM32 MCU with the STM32 hardware abstraction layer. Set up the board config and hit test. The output will be... That didn't work out. Why? That is because there needs to be a mechanism in place that transports the results of the unit test to your PC, which we will call the client from here on. For the Arduino framework, this is already done automatically. The test results are passed to the device's communication peripheral, which is most often the UART peripheral. In short, a unit test needs to call serial print or something similar to print the results for you to read. This something similar is exactly what the project is missing to display a unit test because the STM32 hardware abstraction layer does not have access to serial.print. So let's add the STM32 hardware abstraction layer version of a serial communication with HAL UART transmit. If you've worked with the STM32 hardware abstraction layer, you might know that it offers a lot more clock tree customization than the ESP32 with the Arduino framework, which means that you have to configure a ton more in the initialization routine. The STM32 HAL also gives you access to the actual start of the program, which is int main void. Neither Arduino nor the ESP IDF let you do that, as they both execute some startup code before they let you insert yours, which is in setup or app main respectively. Here our challenge is to correctly set up UR transmission, not necessarily reception, for the STM32 platform and let Unity know how to access these with macros. In this specific example, we are lucky enough to actually test the UART peripheral itself, as our imagined temperature sensor works that way. This of course requires the UART driver code to work in a context that the unit test has to reside in. After all, you need to be able to speak before you can say the words, I can speak. The existence of the statement is enough to verify the statement without requiring its semantic contents. Are you still listening? Let's jump to the code. To enable the UART peripheral on an STM32 with the hardware abstraction layer, we need to set up the UART peripheral both in terms of configuration and hardware connections. But not just any UART. We need the one that is connected to your client PC, which is most likely an ST-Link. You can see the type of connected device by accessing the Devices tab in Platform.io. 
That will show you your board. It requires some data sheet surfing to find out which UART is connected to the ST-Link, but it is most often the USART2 connection. We need a configuration that describes the UART settings and a different configuration to configure the pins. Sadly, the STM hell forces you to write pin configuration for a peripheral as an override of a weak function, which means that you have to use its name and signature. In this case, it has to be named void hell UART MSP init. Only then will the hell draw a connection between your UART config in UART init and your pin config, because that calls hell UART init, which then under the hood calls hell UART MSP init. Quick note. Boards like the Blue Pill do not have a UART USB bridge or anything similar connected to the USB port. Their USB port can only transmit data by configuring the firmware to use the USB port with an actual USB communication method, such as USB CDC, which is not the same as UART. However, this would go beyond this guide. Now that we can write data with HAL UART transmit, we can also configure Unity to use that. For this, we create a unityconfig.h and unityconfig.c. In unityconfig.h, we map the most basic UART functions to the Unity macros. All we need is an init function for the peripheral, a way to write a single character, and optionally, a way to flush data and to finish the transmission. In unityconfig.c, we write the actual implementation of these calls with the mentioned UART functions, which then call the stm 32 hell functions. In short, this is the call stack. With this, Unity can now perform write actions with the UART peripheral to print test results to the client PC. The Platform IO build chain will automatically scan your selected test folder for a Unity config.h file if it exists and use its configured UART calls. With all good things come some caveats. Here's a few of them when using Platform IO unit testing with Unity. In general, unit tests are only as good as you write them. Especially on embedded systems, your hardware may be in a detached state from your program counter, as is the case with timers, DMA, and caches. This puts up additional challenges for your test code as single tests might not actually be completely independent of each other. After all, your device needs to be in an initialized state before you can test certain features, meaning that the results of your test init function were not cleaned up in that sense. In similar spirit, most tests would likely fail if you were to undo what test init performed. Everything UI. You got your button, interrupt service routine and display. But who is going to press that button once you start unit testing? Or even worse, who is going to tell you if the screen shows the correct content? While there are some very ambitious human-machine interaction and computer vision projects, setting this up is not going to be simple or fast. For your maker projects, testing UI will probably be something that you have to do manually. Hard faults. An embedded system will crash or reset ungracefully when encountering a hard fault such as a null dereference. A unit test will not save you from this as the test code still runs on an embedded system. With Unity, this can be seen by a few success messages which then pause and repeat. This is because the MCU resets and executes the test code again, dying at the same line of code as before. Now you learned how you can apply unit testing on an embedded device with Platform IO, Unity and two different platforms and frameworks. Building a project with unit tests from the start will save you a lot of trouble later on, as you can safely rely on the single routines you wrote. You can find the Platform IO project of this demonstration in the accompanying repository. If you like this content and think it is useful, consider a donation with Kofi, as that helps me making this content.